All right. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Johnny. I'm a DevOps engineer at AcureX. My name is Simona. I'm a DevOps engineer at AcureX as well. Um, and today, we're going to talk to you about platforms. Um, but not these kind of platforms. Um, we're talking about uh, internal development platforms, which everyone seems to be talking about these days in very big, grandiose vision type words, um, how they're the brilliant future that we're all going to be working towards in the next five to 10 years. There aren't too many people talking about the first couple steps, how to get started on that path. So um, IDPs may or may not be the future, but right now they are a major investment of time and money to get going. And they're a relatively new space. So there aren't a lot of examples you can point to and say, hey, finance team, let's spend the money to do it like those guys because it's the best practice now. So what's an inspiring or intrepid DevOps engineer supposed to do? Um, what Simone and I are going to talk about today is our experiences building out CLI tools, so command line interface tools that allow you to start making small steps and reducing your engineer's cognitive load that gets you closer to having something that looks like an internal development platform. So first question I want to answer is why CLI tools at all? So most CLI frameworks have, most languages have free open source CLI frameworks you can pick up and start running with. So it's a really low upfront cost. It's no cost at all. You can just download it and start going. And it's a low time investment. These tools do a really good job at extracting away all the stuff you have to worry about with parsing arguments and such. So you can just focus on building out your business logic. And if me and someone do a good job tonight and you're convinced to go start tomorrow and, and start building one of these, you probably could have something usable by Friday. Um, and the other big advantage is there's a lot of low-hanging fruit in this world of reducing cognitive load for your engineers. Like if you start to think about all the different touch points they have with all your different tooling, so you got your cloud provider, got your other cloud provider because you're multi-cloud, um, you got your CI CD tooling, you got your other CI CD tooling because you're multi CI DC tooling, um, you got your logging going somewhere, you got Kubernetes because if you don't got Kubernetes, what are you even doing with your career? Um, you got Kubernetes, that's gonna probably be going Docker and Helm for the ride. You got some infrastructure as code. You got some other infrastructure as code tool because some guy just went off on his own before he got fired. Um, hopefully all this stuff is in source control, but it's a lot. Um, and the less your engineers have to think about, the better off they'll be. And really the better off you'll be. You don't need someone else coming to you complaining about how terrible Kubernetes is. You already know that like deep in your bones. Um, so we're both here today um, to talk about our experiences building CLI tools and why we think they're awesome. Um, we're going to go over some of the lessons we've learned over the course of our careers building these things. Um, and we're going to talk about some of the traps and pitfalls that we've fallen into so that you can hopefully sidestep those and fall into new and exciting traps and pitfalls. Um, so we only have 20 minutes, so let's get started. Um, so the first one I want to talk about is a tool I wrote in the the mid teenies, um, a small Ruby based tool. It's actually open source, it's still out there. I found it when I was doing this talk. I'm like, surprised. Um, context of what we were doing was we were deploying an app in containers. Each time we built the container image, we also built a version of the configuration file. And they were linked via like a, just a build ID so we could keep them together. Made it super easy to roll back. Um, so the version both at build time. We were storing the containers in the image repository. We were storing the configuration files in S3 buckets, which are Amazon's object storage. Um, they were configuration files. They had sensitive information in them, passwords, connection strings, certificates. Uh, so we had to encrypt them. And one of the requirements of the project was it had to be client-side encrypted. So that sounded easy enough. I really thought the AWS CLI would do it but it didn't at the time, and I don't think it does now, because I actually took the screenshot the other day. Um, the Ruby SDK did, and I think the other SDKs do as well. So we just built a really straightforward Ruby utility that did the inscription um, using KMS, uploaded S3, that was it. Super straightforward, it was not complicated at all. Um, until <laughs> we started talking about the uh, 
command line arguments. And then there was some contention, um, which has actually turned out to be a really good thing. At the time, I was surprised about it. But um, looking back, um, it makes a lot of sense. Um, so for whatever your companies do, they probably have a product, and you probably have a team of user researchers and user designers that have dedicated their careers to figuring this stuff out. This is actually our user design team, or user research team. Um, and they do a lot of work to make sure that our software makes sense to our users. So it makes sense that we should spend more than five minutes figuring it out when we're doing something internally. So um, what we learned during those conversations, I'm just going to go in real quick. We spent hours talking about it, but you get the condensed version. Um, so we talked a lot about whether we wanted short names or long names for arguments. We decided the best answer was to have both. So Curl actually does a really good, uh, uh, is a really good example of this. And hopefully everyone knows what Curl is, but it doesn't really matter. Um, so it has a short name. So if you're typing as a person, super easy to just type dash D and, and get going. But if you're doing something in a script or you're doing something in um, like documenting examples, it's super helpful to use a long name there so that someone without the full context about what the command does can kind of piece together what they're looking at. Um, another lesson we, we kind of took away from that was it makes sense to align to a common tool that your engineers are using a lot because a lot of people, a lot of tools used are called differently. So this is probably really hard to see, but on the left is the Azure CLI. Wait, yeah, left. Um, on the right is the um, Kube Huddle. So, um, and they work a little differently. So AZ and the AWS CLI works the same way. Uh, each command for that CLI is linked to a service, and then you perform actions on that service. Kube works the other way. It um, has the action, so get, and then on what resource you want to do, so get pods, gets nodes. Um, and it does, you think about them differently, which you don't think about once you're used to them, but um, if you're using one of them all the time, having your other tools kind of aligned to that same setup is helpful. Um, one trick with this, though, is you got to make sure you're aligned to something that your engineers actually use. Um, for this tool crossing, we aligned to AWS CLI, which actually worked out because our product engineers were doing a lot of work with AWS CLI to upload, S3, upload files to S3. Um, and I thought, oh, that means it's a good idea everywhere, which wasn't the case. Later projects, I tried to do the same thing, but those engineers never used AWS CLI and were really confused by why it was set up that way. Um, so that was a small project, uh, small tool. Let's talk about something a little bit bigger. Um, I'm going to call this the AWS Account CLI. The company I was working with was really, really bad at naming things, so it had a much more complicated name. I don't have time to give you all the context on where it came from, but uh, it was a CLI for uh, creating AWS accounts. Um, basic context here, big enterprise, had a ton of smaller brands that it got through acquisitions, and basically it ran each way their own company inside the, comp inside the larger one. So each brand had its own front-end team, its own data team, its own cloud services team, it's on everything. And then there was a reorg. Um, so we still had the big company, but we only had one front end team, one data team, one cloud services team, one networking team, one of everything now. And we just all served all the brands. Um, so one of the brands had gotten very far in building their own internal IDP. And I guess internal IDP makes, makes sense, personal pin number. Um, their own internal development platform. It was a grand vision. They were going to be, you hit a button, it deploys the AWS account, deploys all the networking configuration, Kubernetes, handles your build pipelines, your deployment pipelines, handles your monitoring. It would have been beautiful if it didn't get smashed to bits um, and torn apart um, during the reorg. So basically, Every part of that kind of fell to whatever team. So on the cloud services team, we ended up with a handful of these different components. All of them were different. Um, they were they were different languages. Uh, they were different endpoints. They had different APIs. They had different parameters. If they were asking for like the same information, it was at least formatted differently. 
Um, if they had authentication, they were all doing it differently. Um, and some were even on different segments of the networks. So they couldn't even talk to each other. Um, which is actually a perfect fit for building a, a CLI tool. Um, we, giving that a single unified interface actually um, turned us around from these accounts taking weeks to provision to taking days. Um, there were two main takeaways from this experience I wanted to share. The first was around language choice, because that usually comes up pretty early in any CLI project. Um, so uh, for this project, we decided to use Go. It was just me and one other engineer. She said, hey, I want to use Go. And I'm like, cool. Um, so use Go. Um, we had a lot of early success, um, which for some reason management thought meant they should give us more developers. Um, and for some reason, they gave us all X Java developers. <laughs> so we had to rehash all our conversations. We actually had to rehash real reasons why we wanted to use Go, which we had as well. Um, and then we had spent a lot of time in pull requests trying to like beat the Java-isms out of their Go code. Um, but um, language choice is a really hard thing to handle. And I can't give you any really good advice, except that it's going to depend on your situation. Um, for our situation, Go worked really well because the reorg left us with a lot of uncertainty around even what CI CD server we'd be using in six months. So being able to just drop in a binary somewhere was attractive because we didn't know if we'd, be, we'd have an environment with Python or Ruby, and if we didn't, what the process would be to get it on there. Um, but you'll have to think about your own situation and figure out what works. Um, the second thing we're all super, super excited to deal with was authentication. Um, so like I said, some of the things were just, hey, I'm on an IP that no one should know about, so it's safe, right? Um, other things did have some sort of authentication, but none were authenticated the same way. Um, so initially, um, we had the operator of the CLI just authenticate without one service and figure out a way to pass that authentication along. This didn't quite scale. Um, so we're like, OK, let's put something in the middle. And there's no good emoji for a Lambda function. So, but I like the sheep, so we're going to stick with it. Um, so we put a Lambda function in the middle. Um, so AWS makes it very easy to permission a Lambda function to um, certain people, so our groups. So we did that. And then um, that function then knew how to talk to everything else. So it knew all the secret IP addresses. If it was a username and password they needed to get to authenticate, it knew where that secret was stored and had access to it. If it needed an IAM role, it had that IAM role. Um, and it was super helpful in consolidating all the authentication to just one thing that the engineer had to do once. Um, it actually had a secondary benefit that we kind of expected, but we're surprised at how well it worked in the end. Um, about six months after we were done with this work, we started saying, hey, we want to start building something like an IDP. We wanted to wire this logic into it. Originally, we thought, oh, we'll just put it in a Jenkins pipeline and call it. But since it was in functions, we were just like, well, can we just call the function? And we could. It actually wired in super easily, and we were able to um, use that logic without really making any changes to it at all, which was super beneficial. So that's a bunch of stuff that happened in the past. My hands off over to Simona. Okay. Uh, let's get back to the present moment. So Johnny and I work for a company called Acurix. Uh, Acurix partners with the NHS to facilitate communication in between patients and their healthcare providers. Uh, NHS is building their solutions on top of Azure, so we've aligned with that and we're building our solutions on Azure too. But if you've been to a lot of these DevOps meetups, you might have noticed that not a lot of other organizations are using Azure as their main cloud provider. And that does pose some challenges because a lot of the engineers that we hire do not have a lot of experience with the tools that we're using. And the community of practice is smaller, so there's less people talking about best practices or extending these tools. Now, we want to reduce our engineers' cognitive load. So the more touch points uh, with our tooling we can remove, the better. And because there aren't as many other organizations using Azure, there are a lot of gaps where we, felt, where we felt we could build something to make engineers' lives easier. So we had no shortage of good ideas for things to build a CLI for. 
The problem was actually on deciding on what to build first. Every planning meeting we discussed possibilities, but it was really difficult to find something that would fit into our schedule. And we decided to pick something very, very small to get started with that we could use to test uh, our initial ideas of building a CLI. So we settled on capturing the privilege escalation request workflow in a CLI command. If you're not familiar with Azure, privilege identity management allows users to request privilege escalation temporarily. We use that pretty extensively at Acurix and it's not the most intuitive workflow. And this is how the workflow looks like right now in a CLI command. So it's pretty easy, straightforward, simple, Acurix or request. You need to pass the role name as an argument and the reason for your request. So starting small has a lot of benefits. Uh, we were able to have the first version ready fairly quickly. Uh, we had concrete use cases to focus our investigation into language choice and interface design. And since we got it done so quickly, we had lots of time to gather user feedback and incorporate it. A uh, big part of Acurix culture is to get user feedback for our products as soon as possible. So we did the same thing for our CLI tool. And we quickly discovered that no two engineers had Python installed the same way. So with that piece of feedback, we were now able to start working on improving the installation story to make sure that users are actually able to install it. I think that if we had delayed the uh, user testing, we would, have, we would have probably started adding more and more functionality to the CLI and the users would, would not be able to benefit from it because they wouldn't be able to install the CLI. So the lessons that you learn from user feedback are probably the most important ones. These are some of our experience building CLIs and the lessons that we've learned. So as Johnny said previously, if IDPs are the future, CLI tools are a good first step towards that future. I know that we did drop a lot of information pretty quickly, so Here's a summary of the lessons that we discussed about. First one, start small. Uh, expect and encourage discussion about user experience. Get user feedback early and often. Uh, language choice is going to be very dependent on the situation. It's very important to have a good installation story for your tooling from the beginning. And you have to realize that not everything has to run locally. <laughs> 